I'm Jonathan Brunt. I'm the government editor of the Spokesman Review. We're here today with Sunny Bird, the one of the Republican candidates for governor. Yes. And, uh, to, and joining us in the conversation is the Spokesman Review Olympia reporter, Ellen Dennis. So thank you very much for being here. Absolutely, and, Jonathan. It's great to be with you. Yeah, thank you. In Spokane. Um, so I just kind of want to start off to just give you a, a, a little a moment to, to make your pitch. Why are you the best candidate to be our next governor? Well, you know, I think our state is uh, at a time where we need someone with the knowledge, skills, and abilities to actually go into Olympia, bring leadership, bring management skills, bring the technical skills that we need to get the job done um, in terms of relating to the economy. We need someone who understands the ledger, understands the ledgering, someone who understands procurement acquisitions and contracting, someone who understands strategically um, international security, border security, um, infrastructure. Um, there's so much to governance of Washington State. It should not be about politics. It should be about the people and performance of governance. And that's really, I think, the difference between myself and the other candidates, or at least the other leading candidates, in that, well, I, I have the experience to actually go in and get the job done. I'm going to work. I'm applying for a job, and uh, that's it. Then the people are my board of directors and uh, hiring panel. So that's how I look at it, position of service and a position of servant leadership. All right. Well, uh, you're, you ha for elected positions, you served on the Richland School Board. What and I guess just talk about how your experience with government or in business yeah. is would relate to such a huge institution as state government because you know a Richland School District one member of that board is one thing and mm -hmm. the state is another so talk about that. oh absolutely and thank you I mean thank you for that opportunity and that question because that goes to it piggybacks beautifully in the the original statement. Which is, for example, I mean, I've gone from high school dropout um, with D's and F's and C's for grades to um, bachelor science degree in business administration. So, and then next level to graduate degree in human resource development. We have approximately 28,000 employees in Washington State. We have bargaining agreements. We, so we have represented labor. And I have a professional human resources. So I have an advanced certification in human resources dealing with people. Um, what else? I'm finishing my uh, PhD in uh, organizational psychology. And so understanding organizational development and how organizations work. I retired from the military 21 years. I worked in special forces, understand international global security, national security, which was related to what we're dealing with in Washington state. I worked in counter narco terrorism, literally tracking cartels down in crime syndicates. We have a problem with fentanyl. We have a problem with mass distribution of drugs that are killing our citizens. Um, the number one killer, 18 to 45. We have a human trafficking problem in Washington State, uh, sex trafficking. Um, I left military active service as a Special Forces Green Beret in special operations. I led intelligence operations internationally. Um, I spoke three languages, Mandarin, Chinese. Well, Asia Pacific is our port, uh, working in different countries throughout the Asia Pacific worked out of the embassies. So I've worked with all international agencies, uh, federal agencies, Drug Enforcement Administration, National Security Administration, CIA, I mean, I can go down the list in terms of experience from military alone, not to mention strategic analysis, uh, situations and implications, and then bringing interventions to bring solutions and remedies. And then I left active duty, went National Guard in the Washington State Army National Guard, I will be the, well, Commander-in-Chief of the National Guard of Washington State if elected to office. You know, Article 3, Section 8 of our Washington State Constitution. I believe that is applicable. Then we can go into, I took a job with the United States Department of Energy, and I worked my way up from a GS nothing to a GS 14 out of 15 on the rank structure. I was the Federal Director of Organizational Development, which is understanding how organizations run, and bringing in interventions to help them run better, more effectively, more efficiently. I think we could use that, not only in our state, but in any organization. And then I became the director of training and leadership for the United States Department of Energy, and that's what I retired of. So during that period of time in between, I was acting chief of staff out at the Hanford Nuclear Site, 
um, with the Office of River Protection. I wrote the leadership uh, methodology and curriculum for WSU Tri-Cities, and so I was hired to teach it because it was cheaper to have me as an employee than a consultant, and I took that job willingly, and I loved teaching leadership to executives and organizational leaders. I did that, and then I started my own company as, well, an organizational development professional where I would go into organizations and help them fine-tune, bring in methodologies such as Lean or Six Sigma, to remove waste and to be more efficient and dial in measurements of performance, helping them to take steps towards excellence. So when we talk about experience, I have a lot of it to do the job that I think needs to be done in Washington State, understanding ledgering. I would do that with my clients. Let me see your books so I can see where the money is being spent, and then I can help you to form solutions to perform more effectively and more efficiently. That's going to save our taxpayers billions of dollars and right now, our administration has doubled the budget in 10 years to $71.5 billion. And our citizens are feeling that. So I'll take a pause because I'm doing a lot of talk. Yeah, and... I was just about to say, but maybe, yeah. I knew, maybe I'll interrupt you. But yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, you brought up fentanyl. Yes. So I just want to give you what would be your solution to the fentanyl crisis we find ourselves in Washington State? Well, I think that we need to recognize the threat that it truly brings. I mean, we have a fentanyl epidemic. We have an addiction epidemic in Washington State, and we can look at our homelessness population and see our homeless population and see exactly what's happening. The number one killer of our brothers and sisters living and dying on the streets is fentanyl poisoning or overdose. Um, I said in my Solutions with Actions, and I will do, I, we will form a joint interagency task force. We do have a partnership with the Drug Enforcement Administration currently. We do have a fusion center with the Washington State Patrol, but not to the level or capacity or capability that I will bring it to because we're not bringing the full resources of state and federal government combined to interdict and to mitigate the threat of fentanyl trafficking and distribution in Washington State. So until you cut off that source, you're going to continue to have a problem because the demand is high and we as a state through bad policy, we've grown that demand, and it continues to grow in itself. What would you do to change that demand? Yes. So we need to bring in and build upon the infrastructure that we have. Our mental health and drug treatment infrastructure is lacking in Washington State, and I never put blame on anybody when I talk about these things because there's no value in that. It's about bringing the solutions. We have about 1,250 beds in Washington State in terms of our medical uh, inpatient care facilities, Eastern State Hospital, Western State Hospital, and some partnerships with private organizations, that's not nearly enough. In terms of our addicted population, we need to understand that addiction is a darkness that takes over um, the mind, the soul, the body, and, and people don't think clearly on their own. They need true compassion of intervention, and that is bringing those services. We need more mental health and more drug treatment professionals in Washington State. Last year, we passed a law, a compact, so that we would have licensure reciprocity where we can bring in more nurses because we have always been short staffed on our nurse. We, nurses, we need more medical professionals. So if we could do that with those much needed and beloved professionals, let's do it with our mental health professionals and our drug treatment professionals and recruit them, plus that up, and then bring resources, and I dare say to incentivize in recruitment with bonuses that we are starting to do with law enforcement and we should do a lot more of. So there are solutions out there if you have someone willing and has the understanding of which solutions are going to be more effective. I do want to bring this in before I turn things over to Ellen for a little bit, but um, the You've been critical, though, of the budget expansion yes. under the last 12 years. So if your solution to fentanyl is boosting mental health services, how are you going to pay for that? Beautiful question. Thank you, um, because that's a common sense question. People are going to want to know that and should want to know that. On day one of my administration, I've been very public about this. I will call for a third-party audit of all state programs and all state offices. And the reason I'm saying that, it's not to penalize. It's not one of those, we're going to target. No, we don't do that. I do this as a consultant. 
we need to see. We have a marijuana tax. We have a gas tax, a liquor tax. Um, we have a gambling tax. We have some of the highest taxes in the nation. But our roads aren't better. Our schools aren't better. Our infrastructure is not better. Where's the money going? We need to assess that. We need to note our revenue streams, note our expenditures, not just dump it in a general uh, fund. And then we need to assess how are our programs performing? What are the metrics of performance? I will make it mandatory that all cabinet positions, all departments, so senior departments, will have a required five-year strategic plan with specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-sensitive performance goals each year over the next five years. And we're going to be transparent. We're going to put in the website. We're going to have a continuous improvement in organizational director in the Office of Financial Management. So the money will come from fiscal responsibility and accountability because when we streamline, we're going to save billions within the first year. I can see that already. And right now we're seeing in the news that our attorney generals caught up with WSU and what they would call a $42 million dollar uh, lawsuit um, regarding contracting and proprieties. And again, not passing judgment, not making any acquisition, uh, accus- accusations. That was a Freudian slip there. But that is just one example of many that we have seen over the last year, two, three, and five, where an audit is conducted, you find that millions of dollars have been wasted or inappropriately used. I think we're going to find the same, and it's just simply to do better. And then once we start doing better, all those monies will be shifted to give us that return on investment that we should have been receiving all along. Okay. Ellen, what uh, what do you want to ask? Yeah. Um, during this gubernatorial cycle, there's been a lot of discussion about abortion in lieu of the influx of people coming from other states seeking reproductive health care in Washington. And I'm curious if you, if elected what your stance would be. Do you support um, current pro-choice legislation in Washington? Well, we have a law, 9.02.100, I believe, is the the uh, revised code of Washington that identifies what you described, uh, which is life and the mother viability of the fetus. This is not a gubernatorial candidate or governor opinion or, or position. Under Article 3, I believe it's Section 6 of the Washington State Constitution, the governor's job is to enforce the law, the rule of law. And so it's not my opinion, it's constitution, constitutional, that I will enforce the laws as written. And the abortion law has been on the books since the 70s. The people of Washington State have chosen and refined that law to be that law. It is not my job or position to be elected and then start talking about changing laws that have been in the books. But what we should be talking about is supporting women. Those women who come in a situation where they need help, they don't need to be vilified, they need that prenatal care. They, we, they, we need to be preventive. We should be going into at-risk communities and talking about prevention and, and how to build up that strength in those communities and in those families so that women don't find themselves in a position where they need it. So there's things that we can do preventively instead of talking about what we're going to fight about in terms of the law. The law is the law, and it is outside of my purview or authority to change it. But I will be bringing solutions with actions to bring choices in terms of a fast and effective way to bring adoption to the table to help those families who would like to have a child and those women who would be willing to share that child with a family who wants that child. I think it's a win-win. So there's options there for us. So let's not um, fight about what we disagree on, but let's unite upon what we can agree on. And, And that is supporting those women who find themselves in difficult positions. So you, to clarify, you'd rather support them offering adoption resources? I'm I'm sorry, Ellen, I did not come yeah, through. Try again. Hear me? Oh, now now I think we can try it again. One two. Yep. Um, so just to clarify, um. People enter Washington from other states who would prefer seeing them offered prenatal care or 
adoption services over um, abortion. I think she's asking for folks who are coming from out of state to get uh, with the intent of an abortion, you you would hope that they would instead get like uh, adoption counseling and um, prenatal care. Oh, no. So, uh, yeah, I could say that that could be an option. But no. And, and Ellen, forgive me if I didn't answer your question directly. I, I, I thought you were asking about our current law in Washington state. Um, regarding um, abortion and and so there's different laws and there is a law that has been brought forward um, more recently than the, um, the the law that I cited to you and that is talking about where folks can come into Washington mm-hmm. uh, to, to seek abortion mm-hmm. and so here's where I disagree for taxpayers of Washington State to pay for other people coming from out of state um, to to get abortions in Washington State um, that that's where I have a problem. I mean, it, now we're and I'm saying this fiscally, not ideologically. It, it's 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 going to bring more of a cost into Washington citizens, and so are Washington citizens passing a law for Washington citizens, or are Washington citizens passing a law for citizens from throughout the Pacific Northwest or any place else in in the nation? And so th- there is where I think it bears further discussion. But in terms of um, acknowledging the law that we have in our state and and adhering to the law of our state, that for me it, it's it's not a difficult decision because it is my mandate constitutionally to uphold the laws of Washington State. Okay, that makes sense. Um, kind of changing gears, another question I have is about um, universities and colleges. So, um, economy is hitting a. Uh, universities, four-year colleges, and community and technical colleges really hard in Washington State. I know, I'm sure you've seen in the past couple of years, we've seen um, rec- like recruiting of students down and dropout rates increasing post-pandemic. If elected governor, what steps would you take to help Washington's education system? Thank you. And and, and I appreciate it. It's, it's very broad and and so I, I I have a field day in answering that but I'll speak to higher education um, I am a fan of the trades I'm a fan of certification programs and the reason I say that it, it's not so as, as you know and you heard me say I we know I've gone from high school dropout to academic and and if I had my choice I would find an island and I would be another Socrates or a Plato or Sun Tzu I would just sit and write philosophy and there I mean I love I love learning. I'm a Phi Kappa Phi. I love learning. That being said, there are needs that are out there in our society, and there are jobs that are needed to be filled with qualified and certified individuals. And I think that is a wonderful pathway as an alternative to higher education, traditional university education. I think once we embolden and build upon those options, I think that will bring a balance to the um, cost of tuition to which I think you're speaking of the increased price of of traditional tuition because I think that you're going to see more people move towards certification with that immediate job placement still making a a wonderful income and livelihood um, with certifications and trade positions which are supporting our economic growth and development and our infrastructure development so it becomes kind of a win-win-win, and I think it's almost a market answer to university pricing because it addresses the demand and the supply and brings in a little bit of competition on that, what we would call that higher education. So I, I'll, I'll leave it at that to give you uh, an opportunity for asking clarifying questions or, or just maybe drilling down a little bit more. I'd love to answer more if you wish. Yeah. Um, do you have any follow-up on that, Jonathan? Actually, I was going to switch to a different topic if we could, just to get more in. Um, we're here in Spokane in a, I don't know, day 18 of a heat wave, uh, breaking records, you know, of most days of 98 plus in a row. And um, this seems to be happening a lot more lately. I just wonder, what's your sense? Do you believe that climate change, that humans have played a role or are playing a role in climate change? You know, we have so many, and I've read, I've read, um, many uh, research papers on climate change and uh, 
varying opinions on it, and, and that's exactly what it is. It's, it's um, I, I want to say, and this is maybe not the appropriate, but I say this academically, it, it's, it's remarkable. Uh, the science that validates both sides of the argument, whereas one side will say it's cyclical, right, and it always has been histor- since history, but I do believe there is no denying that, um, well, putting pollution into the air and, and into the atmosphere and ionosphere, I, I mean, that's a common sense thing. I, I can even make it as rudimentary as saying putting tobacco in your lungs, right? When we would see people light up and back in the day, they thought it was sexy when you're smoking a cigarette. But you could look at that and go, you're inhaling something, some foreign substance in your, your natural human lungs. That can't be healthy. But yet we thought it was cool and they did it for a long time, even though common sense would say that cannot be healthy for you. I think arguably you could say putting carbons at high amounts into the atmosphere is not good for the natural to our nature, right? And so I think we should move towards reducing carbon emissions. And I'm for that. I'm for renewable energy, 100%, but not to the point to which we we cripple our economies. We cripple our citizens' ability to to find income, um, such as, you know, our Climate Commitment Act, which has adversely, uh, you know, affected fuel prices. You know, gasoline up 50 cents a gallon and diesel up 63 cents a gallon. And then you have farmers and truckers and, and others who are supposed to be exempt of the law, by the law, but that somehow fell through the cracks. And so this last session, we had to redo the law to bring them into the law. I mean, it's just, let's do it right. I think we need to revisit this. Um, I think we need to acknowledge that hydroelectricity is renewable energy. I think we need to look at fusion. We're seeing that right now in a partnership in Chelan County. Um, we, right now, we, we even have our, our current governor that is acknowledging small modular portable nuclear reactor as, as a viable uh, energy source. I could not agree more with the experts who agree with me and others because I put this out there uh, over a year ago, um, my support for, for small modular portable nuclear reactors. And we're doing it in Richland right now in the Tri-Cities uh, Energy uh, Northwest is, is leading the way in that, and they have an existing nuclear reactor. These are the subject matter experts. But the other thing is, and I, I digress just a moment, we need to rebuild our electrical transmission uh, infrastructure, so our substation and our power lines. It, it's, it's, it's been underserved, under maintenance, and it's under capacity to even meet the current needs uh, of, of energy for Washington State, for example, you know, just months ago with our coal snap, we had people receiving texts from Puget Sound Energy saying, hey, ease up on your electrical usage because, uh, you know, we can't, we can't hold it. Well, that's because the energy grid couldn't sustain it. So as we're moving forward towards better and more energy resources, renewable energy, let's make it common sense. Let's not take away natural gas and, and bring another burden on us. And then let's not penalize the citizens of our state by raising the cost of, of energy when they should be going down, which is what I'm going to do. I assume, uh, based on what you said, that you uh, will vote to repeal the Climate Commitment Act. Yes. Do you have any I- alternative ideas to lure um, through legislation uh, carbon emissions if, the, if that were to re- be repealed? 100%. Let's talk with proper forest management. You know, as I was driving um, through Spokane yesterday on I-90, I saw a fire starting, and it was, I mean, it was raging just along the side of the, of the road. And you see all the, smart, the, the smoke and all the, the, the carbons going into the atmosphere. Now, this, that was a small scale. I mean, we saw what happened in, in um, uh, the Spokane County area just not too many months ago, um, and it's year after year after year because of mismanagement of our force. Again, I'm not blaming anyone. I'm just saying we can do better. We should do better. And under my administration, we will do better because I will bring solutions for proper force management. Imagine when we're not burning down our natural resources in our environment and we're not putting all that carbon into the air, into the atmosphere from those out-of-control forest fires, and we're also bringing back 
the the resources of timber at, uh, through through forest management and harvesting. I mean, so in that money that goes into our school system to fund education and special education, again, a win, 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 and it's effective way to improve our situation. So that's what I look at. I really do. I look at ways to 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 give a return on investment, not politically, but from a performance perspective. Okay, uh, Ellen, you have a question. Yes. Um, so we've covered Climate Commitment Act. Um, in terms of policing in the state, what are your thoughts on the number of police in Washington? And if elected as governor, how would you balance police accountability um, and kind of keeping everything safe in the state? Yes, yeah, so statistically, we have the lowest amount of law enforcement um, officers per capita of any state in the nation. That's terrible. At the time, that rape is up 51 percent, property crimes up 73 percent, murders up 97 percent. We're seventh or eighth in the nation for the most dangerous state. Um, we're first in the nation for retail theft. We're third in the nation for auto theft. So we've been failing from a law enforcement perspective for a very long time. We need more law enforcement um, presence. And so as a human resources professional with a graduate degree and a certification in advanced and someone who is certified in recruiting and retention, I will bring forth solutions with actions that says we will recruit from outside. And again, that reciprocity of licensure. So a police officer from Missouri can come to Washington State. We can recruit them. We can bring bonus programs, not only to retain our good officers, but bring bonus incentives to recruit good officers to Washington State, get them through that license or transfer, and get them on the streets doing their jobs. We brought back police pursuit, and that was the right move to do through those initiatives. Now we need to support them. And in terms of responsibility and accountability, no one is above the law. But we must make sure that our law enforcement professionals know that they are supported and that they are not going to lose their life and livelihood because they are intimidated or afraid to enforce the law as trained and within the parameters of the law. They will be protected, but at the same time, we will never compromise civil rights right, or human rights in Washington state. And there is that balance, and we can do that because accountability is accountability. And no one is above that, and not even the office of the governor. There should never be a situation, well, because you have some kind of protection that you're governor. No. I work for the people, and the people should always have access and transparent knowledge of how I conduct myself. And it'll be the same thing with law enforcement as well. What is your position on President Trump, January 6th? You support him, correct? I'm voting. I voted for. for I'm voting for right. President Trump. I'll be supporting President Trump's candidacy um, without hesitation. And and when given the the choice between President Biden and President Trump, and now I know it's changed now to Vice President Harris versus President Trump. On both accounts, President Trump has demonstrated the ability to bring policy, energy independence, border security, prosperity for all races, all gen. I mean, we are seeing, and we've, we've seen a need. We've seen what he can do. It's not a matter of saying, I agree with communication styles or leadership styles, but what I'm saying is we can agree that we need someone in office with the leadership strength to represent the people, not an elitist 1%, but the citizens with solutions not politics, but putting people above politics. And so, no, um, President Trump is my candidate for the office of President of the United States of America and for the reason of policy and leadership and strength to not compromise to an elitist group or simply pander to a political party either. But we need someone to represent all citizens of the United States of America just like I'll represent all citizens of Washington State. I think it's a little political question here. Oh, We're yeah. in Washington State. Yes. We know we haven't elected a Republican governor in a long time. Yeah. President Trump is pretty unpopular here. Can a candidate for governor who supports Trump win the governorship? Yeah, so absolutely. And it's not a candidate who supports President Trump because 
President Trump is not my platform, is not my policy. It's not me. I'm Semi Bird, candidate for Washington State Governor. I'm the first candidate for Washington State Governor, a black American endorsed by a political party of this state, the first in the history of Washington State. Media doesn't talk about that, right? People aren't talking about that. But we'll talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion all day long. We'll talk about that all day long. We don't have enough equity. We don't have enough representation. And now we have a candidate who has come forward, not because of quota or equity, but because I have worked hard and earned my way through life navigating adversity. And the citizens of my party chose those delegates came together in the largest delegation in the history of Washington state delegations, and they chose me as their representative by a supermajority vote of 72%. We made history that day. I think we should celebrate that. Instead of talking about the national race and something that has no relevance really to Washington state, I think we should talk about Washington state and the history that we're making right now true representation of all the people, and then showing the greatness of our state and the citizens of our state that they chose a new way, a new path, and a, well, a different type of a candidate than ever before. I I, I think that's wonderful. It shows that we have moved forward here in Washington State and that we are ready for positive and transformational change. All right. Looks like we have maybe about three minutes left. Am I right? Yeah. So I'm going to have Ellen last, ask the last question, but you have to go quick. I'll do my best. Okay. Thanks, Jonathan. Okay. Um, you're running as a Republican. Why are you running as a Republican? And what would you say sets you apart from your other Republican opponents in the primary? I love that question. Okay. I'm a Reconstruction uh, Republican. I be, re- became a Republican when I was 18. I've been a Republican my entire life. And the reason was we were the party of abolition. We were the party of women's rights. We were the party of civil rights, and that is what I looked at when I decided to become a Republican to begin with. Granted, we have fallen off from how we started off, and I'll, and I'll, I'll explain it this way. I was at Juneteenth in Jimi Hendrix Park in Seattle, and thousands of people, and I was surrounded. We talked. It was wonderful, and, and a wonderful family I was speaking with asked me the same question, and then she says, Well, you know what? One thing I have noticed is that, and this is her speaking, not me, Democrats have done a good job of lying to black folks for years, telling them they're going to do something and never come and falling through. But Republicans have been honest about they just don't give a darn about us. And I listened to that, and I took that to heart. And I says, but you acknowledge that you saw me here last year, and you saw me at Emoja Fest last year, too. And she says, well, you're different. And I said, well, thank you, because... I am representing what we started off to be as a Republican Party. And I had a choice. And trust me, it was tempting. Will I still be a Republican in the 21st century? And my answer is, I can either abandon the party of Lincoln and Douglas, or I can bring it back into alignment of what it was, should be, and must be for the future for all citizens of Washington State. I chose the latter. And the difference simply is between the two candidates is I know the difference between the two parties. I have been sharing the fact that I did not stand for the mandates and the lockdowns and the closing of our schools and the isolating of our citizens. Um, The other candidate supported it. Um, I don't support certain things and certain views in terms of um, positions on abortion, as you mentioned, Whereas the other candidate will say to one group that he does, but to the other group, like the Seattle Times editorial board, he surprised them and many of us by saying he supports taxpayer dollars being used to store and stockpile abortion medication. And so when we find these, these, um, I guess, differing opinions or adopted opinions over time, such as voting for cap and trade, and now you're against cap and trade, again, I am true and consistent on my platform, on my positions, that I'm non-political. I'm for the people, for solutions, and for moving Washington State forward in a better, brighter direction. Thank you very much for being here with us in Spokane. Thank you, and we'll um, see you around the campaign trail. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank Thank you, you, everyone.